I can't believe it's September already. And uh, you know what that means, or maybe you don't. Let me tell you, September is National Recovery Month. And Clean Cause is inviting everyone to celebrate the fact that recovery is possible and anything is possible at that. Uh, So here's what you can do. You can grab a Clean Cause Organic Herba Mate and get your day going right with 160 milligrams of better caffeine that won't cause crashes. It won't cause the jitters like coffee and other energy drinks might do. The best part is that every sip makes a difference in the fight against addiction. Clean Cause donates 50% of net profits to support individuals in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. So throughout September, Clean Cause is offering Sober Guy listeners 30%, yes, 30% off their online orders with promo code SOBERGUY30. Just want to give a big thanks to Alex and the Clean Cause team for hooking our listeners up in September. So please, guys, be sure to support them um, in honor of National Recovery Month Grab a boost, live better, transform lives. Head on over to cleancause.com, place an order. It gets shipped directly to your doorstep. It's so nice. You grab it off the doorstep, throw it in your fridge. Clean Cause making some great drinks and supporting a great cause. And you get 30% off your order in the month of September with promo code SOBERGUY30. Cleancause.com, SOBERGUY30 at checkout. Let's start the show. That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Ramey. You're listening to That Sober Guy podcast, and we help people stay sober. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. You can find more podcasts, more resources, and contact us by going to thatsoberguy.com. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at that sober guy podcast. All the links from today's episode will be in the show notes, so they're very easy for you to find. So pumped today to have my good friend TJ Woodward back on the podcast. I think this is his third or fourth time on the show. He's such a great dude. And uh, TJ is a revolutionary recovery expert, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and addiction treatment specialist. Uh, he's the author of the best-selling books, Conscious Being, Awakening to Your True Nature, Conscious Recovery, A Fresh Perspective on Addiction, and Conscious Creation, Five Steps to Embracing the Life of Your Dreams. Uh, and he's the co-author of their accompanying workbooks as well, and uh, the creator of Conscious Recovery Method. Um, we'll talk all about that today. And uh, man, we've known each other quite a few years now. We're gonna we're gonna get into that here in just a sec. But uh, TJ, it's good to have you. I always love like former guests, but also friends of the show when they come on and they hear the first start of the intro comes in and there's a little smile that cracks because that sound, man. And I saw you do that and I thought that was kind of cool. So uh, it's just so great to have you on the podcast, man. Yeah. I mean, your your opening disclaimer is so cool. I just love that. And of course, it's great to be here. I do think this is my fourth time. Yeah, We've been doing this for years and I love what you're up to. And I just want to say thank you for your dedication to continuing this show for all these years. Oh, thanks so much, man. I, I, I do appreciate that. And uh, yeah, we're coming up on, uh, I think, 10 years here pretty, pretty soon. Yeah, which is crazy to me. And uh, so we met, um, and it, like you said, the f- fourth time on the show, a couple of those have been at some of these live conferences that we were doing like pre COVID days where, you know, there'd be a big place, a, a few of them that started down in San Diego at Hotel Del Coronado with Foundations Recovery Network. I think that's where we first met and man, yeah. just setting up in this live format and doing podcasts and networking and just meeting all these awesome people that are in the recovery community. Those were the days, man. I want to, I want to see it getting back to that. It seems like there is some of that uh, on the horizon. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, obviously we've been through quite an experience and for some of us, we're continuing to be in it. Some of us have said I've moved beyond that. And yeah, I look forward to more and more of that. I mean, I'm grateful to be in a community where people are getting together and we're still doing some conferences and a lot of events. So I'm very grateful to be having moved past that and wondering, and I'm curious about, you know, what, what have we learned and how can we use what we've learned to like create a little bit different world right now? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> totally, man. Totally. I think, uh, well, I know one thing that I've learned that it's very important to use uh, the brains that God gave us and, uh, you know, try to uh, look at things 
from all perspectives and then come back in and, and base your opinion, your free opinion, by the way, on, on how we see it, uh, based on the facts and evidence and, and some experience, uh, from ourselves. And that really goes with anything, of course. Um, you know, I don't know. That's one thing I've learned. What about you? <laughs> well, I think, you know, one of the things that I witnessed that I think is really important to have a conversation about, and that is this idea of polarization and kind of what the role of social media with that. And, um, you know, I, I think there were camps, people were put into different camps and I know myself, I didn't fit very firmly into any camp and it was very, it was kind of challenging for me because I was like, wow, I can't really say what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling without someone, you know, kind of coming for me. And the truth is Shane, none of that happened for me because I was able to speak my truth. I think in a compassionate way, because I do understand that people have different points of view. Um, but what happened is there was this idea and, you know, I like to say, I, we've been told we're in a polarized country and I actually don't believe that. I think we've been conditioned to have polarized thinking. And what I mean by that is we've been conditioned to believe in good and bad and right and wrong. And I think there was fear. If I speak outside of my circle, if I have a different opinion, I might get thrown out. And that's very, very like core and tribal. Uh, And I'm interested in moving us beyond that kind of, um, that kind of like, I need everyone in my circle of people to agree with me. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I, I definitely, um, like relate to that in the fact of we need to be able to have different opinions and perspectives in order to, um, not just have like respectful conversations. That's, that's kind of a given I think, but also to grow, like when we stay where we're at in that thinking, like it's so, like we don't have to be threatened by someone else's thoughts or opinion or narrative, I guess. And there was a strong narrative for quite a few years. It was like, it seemed like it went on forever, but like, if you don't think this way and see it this way and do it this way, you're cast out and we're going to cancel your ass and you're done forever. And like I was saying, um, you know, before we started, sober guy we, we've been going for almost 10 years now um you know i i just i love the community i've met so many awesome people um and believe it or not we do have some bad um reviews on the show and most of those came in that time when i was just speaking what i was seeing and feeling and and, and going through personally and that pissed people off man and like <laughs> it's just crazy that some you know that we, that we've had to uh, had to go through some of that but here we are here we are and now how, how do we evolve from this you know I, as you were talking i was thinking about my dad and and his wife they say they live in la lower alabama <laughs> and i live in la california and they came to visit recently and my stepmother who i love said my gosh people are so friendly here that's not what people in in alabama said people in la were going to be like and i said oh don't worry if i took a survey of people in la california they'd probably have some judgments about alabama as well <laughs> and so we live in this this world where we have these narratives that aren't really based in anything other than this idea of groupthink yeah. and i think if you look look back, right? So I have compassion for it because at, there was a time in the evolution of humanity where we needed to have a tribe of people to stay safe. Mm-hmm. And I think that became part of our DNA. And, and you know, that can be debatable, debated because yeah. I've had a little pushback on that. But I think we're if we want to evolve beyond that, we can realize that there's something about each of us that's more similar than it is different. Yeah. And that really we're not our opinions. And it like you, Shane, you and I, I'm trust me, if you and I started talking about all of our opinions, I'm sure we'd find places where we agree and places where we disagree, sure. but we can maintain a connection that's beyond those opinions. In other words, I'm not looking for a tribe of like-minded people anymore because I yeah. want to grow and change and having conversations with people who have a different life experience, different education levels, different socioeconomic status, different races, yeah. all of the things, right? That's how we grow. And then we do find that we can honor the seeming differences, but really we can celebrate that we're more alike than we are different. Yeah. Yeah. Not hate each other or be pissed off at each other because you don't agree with me. It's like, well, that's fine. I don't need to agree. I don't need to agree with you. That's fine. We can still be friends and whatever, you know? Um, yeah, man, it's just been, it's been crazy. Like, uh, I was, uh, who was I telling? I don't know. I was on a podcast recently and I was talking about the last, the, the last conference before conferences kind of got, got the ax for everything. Um, it was like the first time that I was going to get paid 
like for this, for speaking. And I was going to like host the main on the main stage. And man, I was so excited. And, um, and then boom, I had to send that check back. I had to, uh, cancel the whole, the whole thing. And man, it was such a momentum killer at that time. I remember, and I remember being super bummed about it and, and then having to come to the conclusion, like there's just some things in, you know, back to like recovery work stuff. Like there's just some things that are out of my control. I can't control people, places, things, and all I can control is like how I, how I, you know, look at this and how I move forward through it. And so I guess, um, just coming back to the recovery point of that, like not drinking and using drugs is like minuscule part of like dealing with life, like in general, you know, I don't want to minimize it. Cause I know there's a lot of people out there struggling with it actively and that have struggled with it. So yes, it's a, it's the, it's the solution to many other problems in, in some instances. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I'm right there with you on that experience. I had so many speaking events booked and they kept, you know, I kept getting the text. We're going to have to cancel. We're going to have to postpone. And it it occurred to me that I personally um, feel like I have a lot of inner resources. You know, I've been in recovery for a long time. I have a great community. And if it was difficult for me, I was imagining someone new in recovery, not being able to like go to either a meeting or a support group or a therapy group, wherever people find their recovery. And it was really sad for me. And, and I, and I honored those feelings. And so, um, you know, that is one example, um, connection is so important and isolation is actually a big part of, um, the suffering that we yeah. have with addiction. So I agree with you, you know, the, the not drinking and using is obviously an important first step for most of yeah. us. But we realized that was actually a symptom of something or even a, what I call it a brilliant strategy. Some would call yeah. a coping mechanism. But at some point in our recovery, we need to look underneath and what was actually driving this. Drugs and alcohol weren't the problem. They cause problems, obviously. That's the only reason that personally I put them down because yeah. if they're still working, we don't call it addiction. We call it fun. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's funny too because I, I did have – there, there was times drinking and partying and stuff, man, I had a lot of fun. I, I'm always been open about that, but like it, it got to a point where that, you know, that changes when it hits a, a certain threshold and, and thank God, like I went the other direction, but, um, yeah. I was going to ask, so you, so, you know, as, as we're kind of on the conference, uh, topic right now, I mentioned, you know, it seems like on the horizon there, there are some, um, live events coming up. I know that I've been talking with some different people. I know you have the emergence conference coming up. Um, what is that the first thing that you and Jeremy have done or are you guys, have you guys done anything before that? Or what's that looking like? Yeah, so this is actually our third annual Emergence Conference, and it's hosted by Conscious Recovery. Uh, And Emergence is in Orange County now. We were in LA the first year in Marina Del Rey in 2021, and then 22 and 23, we're in Orange County. Um, Emergence is a conference that's really different than a lot of others. Um, No exhibit hall. Mm. We're all in one room. All the vendors are around the outside of the room. No PowerPoints. It's very important to us. We're not here to like educate. We're here to provide an experience for people. So, you know, why do people go to conferences in our field? We want to connect with other people. That's number one, right? Whether that's a business connection, a personal connection. In addition to that, we want to provide a space where people can actually um, look at what needs to be healed within them because our theme this year is healing the healers. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, we're talking about coming out of COVID. We're talking about the divisiveness. Um, people were on the front lines in this field. Burnout is real. So emergence as a conference is dedicated to providing two days for people to drop in and do some deeper healing for themselves, not just focusing on healing their clients, which of course we're all doing anyway. Yeah. I love it. So there's, Sounds like there's a lot of um, uh, connection there. Just hanging out, hearing some good folks speak and that are passionate about what they do and helping other people. And then that, um, you know, that human connection is huge. And of course, having some fun too. I mean, I'm sure you guys have a good time during it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, We call it a combination of a networking event, um, an inspirational talk series and a spiritual (laughs) retreat. That's what emergence is. That So let me, let me back actually no. So the first, cause the first conference that like, after we'd already met and done podcasts and stuff, but do you remember that one that Seth and I came to and Noah was there and you spoke, it was in San Francisco. That was an emergence. So that was a different conference, right? 
It's interesting you say that. So that conference was Modality, and that was hosted by Elevated Addiction Services. And Jeremy and I were a big part of that. And when when you know COVID happened and Elevate you know didn't move forward with that for obvious reasons, um, we kind of took that concept, if you will, and said let's keep doing this in SoCal and honoring that 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 energy that you experienced at Modality. We did that two years, 2018 and 2019. That's the energy of emergence as well. Same vibe, same idea. It's and that's that makes sense then because as you were describing, you know, the upcoming one, that's what I was picturing because it was a lot of that same vibe. It was just a good setting for people to hang out and to talk and to network. And I think you guys served some food. I know Seth, that changed the game for Seth that day. That was his mm-hmm. first conference, and I remember um, that was when he he first was like, "Wow, there's like a whole other." thing out here other than just traditional 12 step he started reading your stuff and noah's stuff and um that, that was that was cool he still talks about that till this day too which i love so uh, man i'm gonna have to check uh, emergence out sometime I, I would love to come and uh and to to be a part of it and help out any way possible too maybe that's something we can discuss uh, later on down the road absolutely yeah absolutely and i and i agree you know one of the things that um you know every year uh, I dedicate myself to having a personal theme. Yeah. This is something yeah. I've been doing for several years. And this year, what was emerging for me in the beginning of the year was really witnessing our field and looking at um, an industry where people come into this work because they want to help others. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then getting caught up in uh, certain things. And one of the things that I see happening a lot is um, people new in recovery, maybe, and they're thrown right in and they're really wanting to help people, but you know, maybe haven't done a lot of their own personal work yet. And so what ends up happening is um, a lot of times, I think in our field, we're actually operating from our own unhealed trauma. Um, and I don't say that as a judgment. I say that as like, how do we, how do I and any of us be part of helping people actually do the deeper healing? Because yeah. if I feel broken, And I think my job is to go into a treatment setting, working in the treatment field and fix a bunch of broken people. There's a lot of um, um, difficulty. There's a lot of frustration and a lot of burnout that comes from that. Totally. Yeah. So, um, and I do, I just had a friend actually who was, um, she was in treatment. She was like two weeks in. I hadn't talked to her in a while and she called and it was so great to hear her. And and she, she was on, um, like I could tell the, by the way she was talking, she was serious about what she was mm. going through. And she, she had like a, just a moment of clarity, um, you know, and, she, and she, it, it was serious. She almost died. And, uh, but that was the first thing, one of the first things she said, and I, and this is the person I never would have thought I hear this. She said, I think I want to go in and, um, and be an addiction counselor when I get done here. So she's already having those thoughts, which is amazing. Like, I, I love to hear it. I was so pumped. I told Jess, you know, we've all been friends forever. And she was like, she was so excited to hear that too, you know? And with that, there comes a lot like of, so now we're starting to think like, I can stay sober. I can, um, you know, hopefully improve my life and, and cut out all these, you know, things that I've been using to deal with trauma and hurt and pain and past and all that stuff by serving other people. But we have to be careful there, right? Because we could get so caught up in that, that we, we start to not deal with some of our own stuff or it can lead to other stuff too. Well, I mean, any take well, on absolutely. that? That's, absolutely. I, I feel like that's kind of what you were saying in a sense. Yeah, it really is. And, and, you know, I, I think people in early recovery, myself included, um, I got sober in 1986 and trust me, that was what was coming up for me. It's like, oh my gosh, I feel so grateful. I didn't go to treatment, but I felt so grateful to be sober and like, oh my gosh, I want to stand on a mountaintop and scream this to the world. You can have this beautiful life. <laughs> yeah. And I became uh, you know, quite passionate in my early yeah. recovery, which I'm really grateful for. And then you know, 18 months, two years, two and a half years, three years, the deeper work um, was required for me to do some of my own deeper reconnecting with my true nature because yeah. that was a big thing I had separated from myself. And so I love that people want to be in the field. You know, I know there are certain treatment programs who shall remain nameless that they literally put someone right into their their addiction, their, their uh, counselor training right after they leave treatment. They mm-hmm. stay on site, wow. right? And so I think I would want to question that because yeah. um, again, like what, 
is the role of a therapist or a counselor or an addiction coach or recovery coach. It really is to provide a space for someone to do their own deeper healing. Yep. But what happens is um, if I feel broken, I'm going to see you as broken and I can't possibly, I mean, I'm going to use this language really consciously. I can't possibly allow someone to go any deeper than I've gone. So if I haven't done, a, you know, there's no finish line to healing. It's not like yeah. ding, ding, I'm healed. Yeah. We're continually healing. In my experience, the more work I do on myself, um, the more I can be available for someone without trying to manipulate or fix them, but just a whole yeah. space for them to get in touch with the part of them that actually has the ability to heal and recovery. Yeah. That, that's such heal a good point. Recover. Like the, well, the, the fixing part too, because we can get in that, like where I'm going to fix you. It's like, nah, you're not going to, you're, you're not going to fix anybody because number one, no one wants to be told what to do. Ask a grown man. If you, if you like tell, tell a grown man what to do, he's probably <laughs> going to give you the middle finger and be like, nah. And, and then he's, it's going to make him go the opposite direction too. So I love what you said, like opening a space up for them to figure it out and guide them, guide, lightly guide, understand, listen, and then, you know, they can figure things out on their own. And I think the best example that I continue to learn, just like you said, cause we're in process is with my wife. Like as a dude, I'm a fixer. She comes to me with something. I'm like, man, we could do this and we could do that. And we need, right, to, right. we need to work out five days a week and we need to eat like, or whatever it is. And it's like, she doesn't want me to fix her. She just wants me to listen right. sometimes and just kind of just be there, you know? And so, man, that's a, that is a huge um, piece of being able to be in this space, I think, and, um, and, and help people because that's, it is a great space to be in. That's right. And, and I think, the one thing you said that's so important for everyone to hear is no one wants to be told what to do. Um, and the other piece that I'll add to that is, and no one's broken anyway, right? Because, yeah. you know, inherently we're all whole. Um, we have separated from our true nature and we've we've developed this sense of brokenness. And because we felt, feel broken, we act broken in the world. That's the shame spiral, right? Yeah. And so shame doesn't heal shame. I'm not saying shame, I'm saying shame. Shame doesn't <laughs> heal shame, right? So we can't, and the old school models of recovery were kind of like, sit down, shut up. I know what I'm talking about. You yeah. don't know anything. Let me tell you what you need to do. Yeah. Um, and I think there's obviously it works to a certain extent. And yeah. then we come to this point where we realize that when we're inviting someone to take a look at what is true for them um, and what what's tricky about the conversation is people come to us, let's say we're working in treatment. They're coming to treatment at the possibly the darkest time of their life. Yeah. Um, they obviously can't do it alone or they wouldn't be in treatment. So we have a role. Um, obviously, I'm not saying everyone can just do their own healing. The support groups, the treatment programs, all those are so important. But in the end, my work is really about how am I viewing the person I'm sitting in front of? Do I look at them as broken and what does that create? Do I look at them as having the innate ability to heal? And then we can be co-curious about what is at the root of this what are the core false beliefs that are driving it? In what ways did addiction help you and not help you? And yeah. now what do you truly desire? And let's do this together. Mm, man, that's, yeah, that's crazy. Because when you think about it, like if you sit down with um, a therapist, a counselor, a recovery coach, like whatever it is, you really have to be careful um, that you're not sitting with someone who has like, a huge ego, right? Who wants to just be there just to help you because I'm going to do what, what you're saying is being open to doing it together. Like there's no, there's no like a hierarchy in it, I guess. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's just, let's sit down as human beings and talk about this. And yeah. so, man, yeah, I, I, I guess we got to be uh, a little, a little more aware of that as we're you know, as we're working with people and sometimes you got to find different meetings or counselors or therapists before you find a good fit for somebody. I like to tell people that a lot, absolutely. like look around a little bit. You might hate the first meeting you go to maybe find a different yeah, absolutely. one. Whatever. Yeah. Because meetings or support groups, they all have yeah. different energies. Right. Yep. And so I, I think what we're talking about is something that for me is very fundamental. And that's why the theme for this year, as I was sitting with it for me was, how can I provide a space to help the healers heal? Mm. Um, and what I mean by That's that great. is, 
you know, so often when we think about self-care, we think about, oh, I'm going to take a day off. I'm going to go to a retreat. I'm going to unplug. But the deeper self-care is doing our own trauma healing. For me, it's trauma healing yeah. um, and really healing our own shame and then reconnecting with our our true nature. And then from that place, then how can I serve others? Um, and And I don't, you know, this might be controversial to say, but I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with wanting to help others for a selfish reason. I yeah, think that in yeah. some ways we do that, but for most of us, we reach a point where we're like, and and so let me let me just say it this way. I reached a point in my yeah. early recovery when I was 18 months sober and I was suicidal. Mm. And the paradigm at the time was don't worry about anything but not drinking. Your life is a miracle. Now go help someone else. Yeah. And I had been doing that for 18 months and I had been loving life. But suddenly all the stuff that hadn't been addressed was coming up and I didn't yeah. know what to do with it. And I feel so fortunate. I didn't you know, relapse, but I found someone who really helped me on a different journey of recovery. And that was one of unlearning and returning to my true nature. And I worked with this woman for several years and did some yeah. really, really deep work. As a matter of fact, she's the person who wrote the four step guide for Hazelden. And I didn't even know that at the time, but um, she really helped me reconnect with who I really am. And it was like, oh my gosh, recovery is a different, it means something different to me now than it did yeah. when I was new. And all of it is valid and all of it is perfect, but I'm interested right now in holding a space for people to do some of this deeper healing. Yeah. So I, I heard, I heard something recently that, that relates to this, I feel like. And so I'll ask you the question, um, yeah. you know, to it, but I heard someone say we need, we, it's okay to be critical of ourselves without hating ourselves. So like, I feel like that does tie into a lot of that old, old stuff. And you, and you mentioned too unlearning. And I know we've talked about on this show a couple of times, the unlearning piece, and that's huge. Like, it's not, so I don't need to go out and learn a bunch of new shit. Like I just need to unlearn all the old crap that, you know, that is kind of, you know, having issues I'm having issues with. So like, how do we, how do we do that? Like, how do we deal with the trauma, shame? How do we be critical of ourselves in a healthy manner so we can grow like without hating ourselves? So words are very interesting, right? So for for me, the, the word I would use isn't critical, but I understand what you're saying, like yeah. to look at ourselves, right? So for me, it's like the difference between self-criticism and blame or self-accountability and curiosity. Mm. I mean, that's what it comes down yeah. to. Yeah. Um, because the, the truth is I was blaming the world for my circumstances for so long, right? The world, it's the world's fault. I mean, my God, it was my parents' fault. They were horrible. They didn't give me what I needed. All of that, blame, blame, blame. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh shit, it's my responsibility. So I just took that blame and started blaming myself. Mm -hmm. And that was actually much more painful than blaming the world because then I went into this deep shame spiral. And at some point I realized that the way we actually work with this is through curiosity because judgment keeps us stuck. It restricts and curiosity expands. So becoming curious about what was at the root of this, becoming curious about my own unhealed past, becoming curious about the points of view I had about the world. And so for me, that's the word I would use instead of um, critic, self-critical, although, you know, critical thinking at its, yeah. at its, you know, simplest form is like, let me take a look here and do some assessment. But it's, it's funny though, too, you say that because I didn't, I didn't think about that critical when I say that. And even when I said, be, how do we be critical of ourselves without hating? Even when I'm saying critical, I'm feeling a negative kind of connotation that comes with it, even as I say it. So yeah. you're right. Words are powerful, man. Like words are weapons sometimes. And, and they, um, you know, it's, it is important to recognize them when we can, you know, and be like, wait, I don't have to, I can frame it up a little different. Sometimes yeah. that's all we need, right? It's just to frame it up a little bit different. And then we get a new, new perspective on it. And so you touched on the victim mentality too. Yeah. Like, man, same dude. Like, my dad, this, like, you know, I, we didn't have this. I grew up like we'd go down the list of things like screw this yeah. person, man, that victim mentality will literally destroy you. So how do we, how do we improve on that? How do we break free from the chains of like a victim mentality? So this is one of my favorite conversations and it's, it's a nuanced conversation. So for anyone watching and listening right now, what I'm, what I'm going to say about victim consciousness is as long as I am blaming the world for the conditions of my life, I'm stuck. Mm. 
And where get people get tripped up with this, because I will say the way we move out of victim consciousness is to be 100% accountable for our lives. And someone will say to me, oh, are you blame? Are you victim blaming? So let's look at something extreme like sexual trauma. I am not saying that it was a person's fault because they were sexually abused as a child, not in any way. What I'm saying is because of that abuse, they developed and I developed a core false belief about myself that became the basic operating system at which I'm functioning. And usually it's something like I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, or I'm not worthy. And not only is that a thought, but it's a vibration. And then we walk into our adult life with the vibration of, I'm a victim, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy. And we start choosing over and over again, unconsciously, relationships to confirm that core false belief. We're not saying it's the person's fault, but what we want to do is say, as long as I'm blaming the situation, I'm actually not empowering myself. When I unplug from that and say, let me be accountable for the choices I've made from my unconscious core false beliefs, I can start to empower myself. So again, we're not blaming ourselves. We're not letting the person off the hook. People are so stuck on that, right? Someone is abusive. Now we say, you know, toxic relationships. How do we get rid of them? Um, That could be true, but the only place of power is to unplug from that and say, what within me is wanting to heal so that I'm not choosing that? Again, it's not saying they did or didn't do it. And that's where people can get stuck. The true empowerment is to say, if this vibration is coming from me, I can start to change that. Mm, Yeah, man. Yeah, that's, um, I I feel like that is, it's in all of us a little bit to some extent, at least, well, I don't know. I I just, and all the people I've talked to, like there's always something that usually that has happened at some point in their life where they they be, they began to identify through that incident in some sense or another you know a, a yeah. loss of a family member abuse a, you know whatever it is um and it, it's hard it's hard to break it's hard to break free from that and that and so as you were kind of saying that too i was sitting there thinking like we we've already talked we've only been here what for 30 minutes now we've we've talked about a lot of stuff and we, and um even over the past 10 years continuing to learn the process talking about a lot of stuff we can talk about all the stuff we can have the resources this you know um solutions through experience or whatever it is but none of that none of that matters if we're not conscious and so i'm thinking about conscious recovery kind of as i'm thinking this so like how and i say that a lot too i'm like well man i I messed up today you know um i let's say i I got pissed off at my son real quick and i raised my voice and i yelled a little bit but man i'm so glad that i'm conscious today to realize that so i can fix it and go apologize to him and tell him i'm sorry and that dad's not perfect either and i'm gonna do better next time i have to be conscious of that to even move towards a, a purposeful positive direction in that so like I don't know if there's an, a question or even an answer to this, but like, how do we become more conscious in, in just our day-to-day grind, the day-to-day walk? Well, I love what you're saying because that is the foundation of conscious recovery. It's how do we become more consciously aware of yeah. what's actually trapped in the unconscious or the subconscious that is literally running the show yep. and it's what we call reality, right? And so a lot of addiction treatment focuses on symptoms and behaviors. And the way I say it is if you plant a maple seed, you get a maple tree, right? So if I have a seed, which is in the unconscious underground or buried, I'm not lovable. I have an, I'm not lovable tree. And the symptom can be addiction. The symptom can be anxiety or depression. The symptom can be what we call anger issues, which I could do. We could do a whole show on that, but we need to get down to the root, if you will, and the seed and say, where did these ideas um, originate? Bessel van der Kolk in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, says uh, uh, um, trauma doesn't show up as a memory. It shows up as a reaction, Mm. right? So it's in our bodies. We want to get down and we don't have to re-experience the trauma over and over and over again to heal it. What we're saying here that's really important is it's not as much about the event or what happened because I spent a decade, literally a decade in therapy in my 20s 
figuring out the patterns. And I was like, in the end of all of this therapy, and I'm therapy is wonderful. And what I was doing with it was I was like, but I, I see the patterns, but how do I actually change them. Yeah. And so conscious recovery is interested in where these originated and how we can actually go back and start to heal it at a very, very deep level, not just continuing to focus on, oh, I have anxiety. Oh, I keep choosing these partners. Oh, I have these work situations. It's like, what is the root of that? How do we actually start to heal that? Because I know that we can do it. Oh yeah, to- totally, man. Totally. We just, we that, we got to frame it up the right way. We have to be open, you know, to learning. We got to be open to different opinions and different thoughts. And that's what helps us grow and and come together and learn from each other. Man, I lo- love this stuff. I always enjoy chatting with you, man. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll do it again soon. We just got a few minutes Absolutely. left. Um, yeah. Anything, anything you want to um, kind of wrap up with today or any advice for anyone out there or, and then I want to talk a little more about the conference right before we, uh, before we sign off too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime anyone asks me, is there anything else you want to say? I find myself pretty much saying the same thing (laughs) because it's the foundational message that changed my life. And that is some version of this. If no one's told you yet today, you are a whole and perfect being. You came into this world as a particle of the divine, and that's still the truth of who and what you are. And maybe you've gathered a lot of evidence or um, conclusions about the world because of your experiences, but underneath all of that, no matter what you've done and no matter what's happened to you, there is still that place within you that is whole and perfect Mm -hmm. and recovery or the spiritual journey is about returning to that. I love it, man. I love it. And we'll, we'll put all the links. Where where can folks find you on Instagram uh, website? Yeah. Instagram's good. TJ Woodward underscore. That's probably the best starting place. Okay, cool. And we'll put all those links in the show notes guys. So they're easy for you to find in there so you can connect with TJ. Um, Emergence conference. What are the dates? How do folks get a ticket? Where can they check it out at? Yeah. Emergence is happening on September 28th and 29th. It's a Thursday and Friday in Orange County. This is for anyone working in behavioral health or for that matter, anyone in recovery who wants to come take a deeper dive into their own healing consciousrecovery.com forward slash emergence where we've made the price really reasonable. Uh, you know, there's a conference right now I'm going to, that's a thousand bucks to attend. We're not doing that. We're keeping this as reasonable as possible just to, you know, pay the hotel and provide yeah. the space. So we invite you to join us. Awesome, man. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll put that link in there too. Uh, be sure to check it out guys. And thanks TJ so much for coming on. Um, and, uh, dude, it's always a, a pleasure, man, just to hang out and to, to chat a bit. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, keeping it going and doing another one soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I uh, hope some spoke to you. you share the podcast with a friend. Be sure to follow TJ on Instagram, tjwoodward.com. Check out the emergence conference. Love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Peace, love, and respect. Keep your blood clean.